Good evening, friends. A uh, very warm welcome from Kaho to each and every one of you. Uh, so today, uh, thank you for joining for, to discuss this important topic that is medication without harm. So it is my privilege to invite Dr. Shweta Prabhakar. She is chairman North Zone for Kaho, and she is working as head of patient uh, safety and quality and academics at Fortis Hospital, Mohali. So may I request Dr. Shweta to take over and moderate the session, please. Thank you, Mr. Satish. Uh, that's a wonderful welcome. And uh, I'm really excited for this session of uh, North Zone. And we uh, start with the uh, uh, eminent faculty, which is here, the specialist uh, from, the, from the field of uh, medication, or the, we can say, talk about those uh, experts, subject matter experts are here. And I'm really excited to uh, take this session uh, and uh, discuss some of the very eminent points, which we uh, do consider that they're important with respect to patient safety and, uh, and also in medication safety. Now, uh, the, I would just like to brief uh, everyone that uh, as Kaho, we have taken this initiative to spread awareness regarding medication without harm. And medication without harm is also being taken as theme by WHO in this World Patient Safety Day celebration. So this month, September, on 17 September, we celebrate World Patient Safety Day. And the theme is medication without harm. And uh, so we have uh, some very eminent uh, uh, faculty here. I would be inviting each one of the faculties and, uh, you know, would, you know uh, try to discuss about some of the uh, challenges and uh, how they think that we can overcome them and what is the need of the hour. So uh, I now take on the uh, you know, privilege of uh, inviting uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Ranga. He's a deputy uh, drug controller at uh, Baddi uh, you know, office. He's at the regional office there and he's representing Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now, uh, you know, when we start uh, his uh, experience and his uh, achievements, it's, it's endless. So I really, uh, you know, it's a privilege to him being here with us and talk about uh, uh, about medication without harm. Uh, so just a quick brief, he's got a lot of, uh, you know, initiatives which he has started with respect to the international MOUs with the different countries uh, with regards to medication, uh, you know, safety. And uh, also he's, uh, you know, got uh, his uh, e-governance program, he initiated that. So that is uh, very, uh, we would definitely like to have an insight into it uh, sometime uh, in our talk and also, you know, uh, with with the with that, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, my interest would be. You know, how do we consider from the uh, from the government uh, perspective? How do they consider as uh, medication without harm? What are where does the work stop there? So, uh, Doctor uh, Chandrasekhar, over to you, sir, and uh, would uh, love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Doctor Shweta. So before going into the details, uh, I would like to say that the last four years I've been heading the biological and vaccine divisions at CDSCO. And uh, earlier to that, uh, for six years, I was heading the small molecules. So basically, uh, in, since the last 10 years, I have been uh, regulating the clinical trials and the approval of the new drugs uh, in the country. So as a regulator, so what I see, what everyone sees before a drug is approved, so there are three parameters that uh, many of you might know. The first one is the safety. The second one is efficacy. And of course, the quality. So safety is the paramount. Huh? So without uh, ensuring that a drug is safe, so it cannot be approved by any regulator in the world. So how safety, how safety is uh, uh, accounted, uh, how the safety data is accumulated, so it depends upon the lifestyle, life cycle of the particular drug. So before a drug is approved, the safety data is, from, is obtained from the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And uh, once consider, considering all this data, if the benefits outweigh the risks, then the drug is approved for marketing in the country. So, so for, for approval of the drug, it is necessary that you should have a complete summary of the safety and efficacy data so that uh, the regulator will be able to assess that the risks are 
uh, far less when compared to the benefits. So, but uh, at the time of approval, so what is the uh, data, the uh, safety data that is available with the regulator? Uh, initially, it would be only from the clinical studies. So clinical studies, as you know, are done in very controlled settings and the uh, patient data that is available is minimal. So generally it runs in few thousands of them maximum. So uh, because of that, it, it is possible that a lot of safety data is not available at the time of approval. But however, if you keep on insisting for generating more safety data, so you are denying a drug to the patients. Uh, so that is why the, most of the regulators, they consider uh, the available data and adequate stat statistical sample size, and then uh, they grant based on the safety and efficacy data. So subsequent to the uh, approval, at the time of approval, so you know, many of you know that every drug is accompanied with a prescribing information. So it is expected uh, for, as a regulatory requirement that the prescribing information or package insert, whichever name it may be called. So you should summarize the entire the safety data and what are the sources of that data that have been, uh, where the safety has been captured. Based on this, the physician is expected to, uh, to assess whether this particular drug, if it is given to a particular pa a patient with certain conditions, so it, the, the benefits outweigh the risks. So then only he is expected to prescribe the medicine. If there are so many situations where even though overall the benefits may outweigh risk, the particular patient may have more risks when compared to the benefits. In such a cases, the physician is not expected. Uh, and uh, the data which the physician relies is only on the package uh, insert or the prescribing information. So it is necessary that the pharma industry, the physician and the patient should contribute uh, for uh, generating, updating the uh, uh, safety data so that it becomes part of the prescribing information. And whenever a patient or the physician would like to use this drug, so he takes a considered decision. So this is the basic, uh, this thing. So, but as I said earlier, because the patient data is less at the time of approval, that is only from the clinical data, it is necessary that real world evidence uh, safety data should be captured. And this safety real world evidence data regarding the safety is captured by post marketing trials or a, uh, spontaneous reports or PSURs or uh, other pharmacovigilance programs. So, as a patient, the patient is expected to report each and every adverse uh, ADRs, adverse drug re reactions, whether it might be related to the drug or it might not be related that the patient may not be able to decide, but he is expected to report it to the physician and the physician is expected to report it to the pharmacovigilance program or maybe uh, any other initiatives by the manufacturer or, or wherever a, a structured data is being collected. So based on this, so there are systems because uh, if, uh, uh, if, a, if an ADR is found to be related to a particular drug, then uh, the the regulators, what they see is that if, if this is a signal uh, and if it is a signal, then it becomes, they say that it should become part of the prescribing information so that the physician and the patient should take a considered decision. So this is the, the life cycle of the, uh, how the safety data is generated. So as we see that uh, when a drug is approved after a few years, five years, 10 years, we have seen so many drugs have been uh, discontinued because uh, they were more risks that have been uh, found to be related to this particular drug rather than the benefits. So it might be possible that uh, as the data emerges, so regulator takes a uh, consideration that it might be withdrawn. So this is this is how uh, the entire uh, amount of the uh, safety data. But uh, I, I again reiterate that safety is the uh, utmost par paramount uh, requirement until unless it is not safe, even though it may be uh, however it may be efficacious, then it is not approved in any country, including India. Uh, as far as the Indian context is concerned, uh, our major uh, issue is that many of the drugs, as we all know, they are approved in other countries. So what we do is that we adopt the drug uh, to Indian population. But at the time of approval, what we require is that we ask them to conduct a bridging trial in India. 
So bridging trial is basically on very few hundreds of patients because we see only if the data is, uh, which has been generated in other countries, whether it is replicated in Indian uh, Indian context or not. So the safety data on Indian patients is very small. And uh, as uh, when when it is approved, because we rely on the package insert and the safety data of the Indian population is not uh, reflected in this package insert. So whatever safety data we see, it is generally the innovators data and this data is generated uh, from uh, the patients in other countries. So, so what is the remedy? Is, what is the remedy is that? So we should try to report as many ADRs to the pharmacovigilance program or any other initiatives, as I said earlier, and try to uh, update this safety information, especially from the Indian uh, perspective, so that so it is possible because of so many uh, issues like genetic makeup, uh, race, and all. So the, the safety may differ. So it is necessary that because of Indian large uh, population in India, that we should have our own safety uh, database for each of the drug. So the patient will benefit and the uh, physician will take a considered decision while prescribing. So thank you, Dr. Shweta. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. That was a very good insight. And I'm going to come back on uh, the pharmacovigilance program because that's, uh, again, a very good initiative by our government, which they have taken, and uh, trying to induct hospitals and, uh, in, and encouraging reporting of ADRs, which, is, which will build up our safety data of our own country. And uh, so thank you very much. I uh, would now move on to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, he's the chief clinical pharmacologist at uh, Indra Kapolo Hospital. And uh, he is again a very uh, you know, dynamic personality with a change oriented uh, healthcare leader and leader mentor who is now working, who's also a member secretary for uh, the ethics committee of stem cell research at uh, Indra Kapolo Hospital. He is a certified member of medication as a medication safety officer and Six Sigma Green Belt. He has uh, various awards in his uh, in his bag, including Fiki and Gold HMA award. Uh, he's uh, pinned around sixteen publications in reputed journals and six uh, book chapters. So, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, uh, uh, over to you. I uh, the buck stops. Where does the buck stops? Now you have to take on from here and give your insight. Uh, into from the healthcare, uh, you know, uh, in the healthcare, uh, private healthcare sector, where what's uh, your uh, insights or what's your perspective towards this uh, particular aspect? Uh, thank you, uh, Sweta, and thank you, Paho, for giving me this opportunity to talk on very relevant and very important. I have some slides. So I'm going to talk about very important group of drug called high relevant medications and this is my institute from where I come. These are basically what are these high alert medications? These are those medications which are part of high percentage of medication errors and have sentinel events may be associated with them. They may cause harm more frequently and maybe less also but harm becomes more serious when any medication errors happens with these drugs leading to more patient suffering and potential additional cost. So this, this literature says opioid drug, insulins, anticoagulant, these are half of the preventable uh, adverse drug event happens with these drugs, leading to 3.5 billion US dollars spent on additional cost of caring with these drugs. So how this a hospital can prepare their uh, this high alert medication list of course, we can take help from ISMP Institute of Safe Medication Practices. We can take some clue from WHO. We can take clue from our adverse drug monitoring from our hospital. Maybe some clue from pharmacovigilance program of India. Some clue from uh, reported literature about that drugs where th those drugs are more toxic. This list is prepared, discussed in Drugs and Therapy Committee. It is finalized. Once this list of this high alert medication is prepared, this is displayed in all the areas. All the people are trained about that. We have we, we take care of their stories, how they are procured, who prescribes them, 
how they are administered, how they are monitored, all these aspects are taken care. One of these killer medications are concentrated electrolyte. It's always a good idea if we remove them from other places except pharmacy. And if we can, uh, if we can mix them, admixture can be done outside from patient care area and then it is delivered. The, the risk is considerably reduced. And when we administered at least two independent persons looks into them before drugs get mixed. This is one of the example I'll just give for concentrated electrolytes where we have defined guidelines of concentrated electrolyte replacement. And if this standardized protocol is not followed, we should be able to question them that why there is a limit, uh, why there is a change from that. Those changes may be some medication error may be associated there. And if wherever they are stored except pharmacy, we should, we should every year review them, look into benefit versus risk ratio and store them under double lock uh, so that at least two person will see and make sure, uh, make sure that uh, they are, uh, uh, they are diluted, they are not given undiluted and they are prepared under laminar wood. I told it's a good practice if we can prepare them outside those area and we have a good monitoring parameter and lab parameter for checking. Of course, there is a labeling and once they are administered, we have a high alert monitoring for this kind of drugs in the system. This is one of these where dilutions, this is another area where uh, when I did my MBBS, nobody taught me in pharmacology or medication how I need to dilute this medication. These are the things, probably this is the time where it should be part of curriculum. In pharmacology, uh, uh, medicine, when we are studying, this should be taught and there should be a standard, standard reference in India for all those great drugs for dilution. This is my labels where I, clearly it says diluted before it is used and once it is diluted and it talks about how much dilution, what's the infusion rate, central line, for what purpose this is. These are some of the contributing uh, factors leading to errors, incomplete knowledge about drug names. We have so many brands in India at, and we have more than uh, 1.2 lakhs brands in India and every year 10,000 brands added and similar number of brands are deleted uh, from uh, available drugs. So we need to have one particular source. And now because of mobility, people from south travel to north, from uh, north to east and east to this, it becomes difficult for clinicians to know what is this drug for and what is this drug patient is on. Again, drug information is another area where we require lot, lot and lot of changes. Most of clinicians knowledge at current, I'm sorry to say, comes from medical representative. Institute like PGI and AIMS, they should have good uh, drug information center and of course, bigger institute like Apollo and Fortis. Uh, Max, we need to have our good in drug information center so that unbiased knowledge when representative talks about, he gives one side of the story. And when drug information center talks about, we give different types of knowledge. Of course, new uh, product available and we look, need to look into uh, similar packaging, labeling. Uh, in the US, uh, there is an institute where they look into all this aspect. In India, probably uh, we need to do this change. Organization like Kaho can come in this. And before you uh, make a new product labeling, we scan them that these are looking like this product, please change this. Of course, illegible handwriting can be taken care by uh, physician uh, order entries, uh, CPOE, and of course, failure of SOPs and guidelines, and of course, prescription audit, which we'll be talking about. These are some of the strategies like Tolman Lattery for uh, look-alike sound like medications. Red beans, I'll talk about for concentrated electrolyte and paralyzing agent. 
these are two killer group of medication concentrated electrolyte and paralyzing agent if you don't take care of their safety they may kill the patients of course cpoe and another important is bar coating we are we are uh, doing export of those medications where all have barcodes but the in house consumption medication doesn't have barcode if barcode comes the nurse can scan and easily we can track whether we are giving the right drug to the patient or not so this is the major change probably uh, india has to uh, bring in another is of course smart infusion form where we have a software link with that and or this is the time to start order sets in icus and of course independent double check where two different healthcare prescribers verify every steps independently and it should not be only at the time of administration of course at the time of dispensing these two steps this is one of the case where 40 year old male came with history of pe on warfarin and a patient was admitted with bilateral hydronephrosis with acute renal failure nephrostomy tube placement post nephrostomy uh, tube the anticoagulation was resumed with inox of rn120 mg uh, twice daily uh, in the setting of severely compromised renal functions patient was transferred to icu with clinical picture of shock like thing thing hemorrhagic uh, uh, there was a multi organ failure and when ultrasound was done there was a uh, evidence of uh, intra abdominal uh, collections there the common risk for such drugs we don't have standardized uh, names and packs complicated dosing regime for doctors to remember low molecular weight heparin syringes are designed for adult and we do use for them for pediatrics we don't have designed doses for them common strategies standardized labeling of them packaging them anticoagulant services this time to start them counseling of the patients where we lack medication reconciliation is another area where we need to improve because maximum errors happen this opioid drugs again this uh, lack of leading zero is responsible for multiple errors and where we give bolus dose sometimes we forget to reprogram for maintenance doses and of course there are a lot of product which have different concentration of label standardizing those concentration uh, and disposal as dr nosar was talking about for this uh, drugs chemotherapy drugs is another where we need personal protective uh, equipment for the employee who are handling them uh when christine of course always dispense the them in a bag rather than a syringe methotrexate we were talking about that will uh, will and of course updated uh, lab information on chemotherapy and communication to the patient and family this is one of the list uh, for example i have given where we have also used tolman lettering and indication for those drugs these are some of the examples this this is a topic where i can speak on morning to uh, night so i am just stopping here and of course where does buck stop it is with everyone basically all of us until unless we make a team we can't solve this puzzle thank you dr sanjeev uh, that was quite a comprehensive uh, slide and an overview about medication safety and uh, i'm sure uh, everyone was uh, very into about the slides which they wanted uh, because there was so much into it and uh, you probably covered but i really appreciate the last sentence where it's a team work so where, where when we talk about the where does the bug stops it talks you know it's the all people who are involved in this uh, medication cycle they are uh, each one of them is responsible uh, in their own aspects or in their own function so uh, now i would uh, move on to our next uh, speaker uh, dr sandeep arora and uh, he is a professor director at mit institute of Pharm pharmacy and uh, he is uh, currently stationed in noida he has got around more than 27 years in pharma operations quality management academic trainings research consultancy planning and administration experience and uh, he is uh, uh, he is also heading as the honorary president of rnd natural solutions 
he is an avid researcher which i know personally him that uh, he is so passionate about academics and uh, if you uh, if i just name that he's got around 42 patents 170 research publications four books and four trademarks and uh, three books which he has written so uh, he is he is a you know kind of a sea of knowledge about pharmacy and if you talk to him he it's like endless and very enriching uh, you know sessions and discussions can carry on so uh, uh, dr sandeep thank you uh, for uh, joining in and uh, now i would just uh, want your insight into you know you see them young you know the the pharmacist uh, you train them and you bring them you know to uh, to the you expose them to the the clinicians and to, to the healthcare. So, uh, in in your aspect, how do you consider that how we can you know address this medication without harm, and uh, where does the buck stop there? And uh, I would also like you to take the lead from Dr. Nusrat when she spoke about you know the educating our uh, young uh, you know uh, healthcare workers or you know, uh, about medication safety. So you do touch upon that aspect also, how do, how we are doing it currently and what is the need for a change, if any. Over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prabhakar, for inviting and uh, very good evening to all the panelists here, Dr. Nusrat, Dr. Sanjeev, Dr. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar and uh, the other members. Uh, it's a very uh, very relevant topic and uh, as far as uh, I, I am uh, uh, from the pharma industry and uh, taking care of the all the aspects related to the the academics the training and the research at the smaller level and the, uh, the larger level wherein the products come out and today we are talking about the patient safety as far as the medication is concerned so uh, one part is uh, the uh, medicine quality that uh, the pharma industry needs to make sure that uh, they have the particular uh, thing that is called as the uniformity from batch to batch. I think that, that is for the pharma industry to take care that they assure that every tablet in every strip is of the same quality and it does not offer any scope for any change when the medication for a patient is being done for a long time or uh, whether it is in, in, uh, inpatient or outpatient. So that is for the pharma industry and uh, also uh, as far as the stability for the medication is concerned for the given shelf life period as mentioned on the uh, strip or the vial or the other packaging as far as the manufacturing expiry date are concerned they should be uh, they should be well <coughs> studied and well researched and well established uh, before they are uh, uh, the printed on the in the package so these are the two main things that the pharma industry should take care of as far as the prevention of any medication damage or uh, uh, issues in safety is concerned uh, stability issues as well as the uniformity of quality from uh, tablet to tablet and uh, also the uh, the the third part is the 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 uh, the printing the overprinting and as far as the information given on the uh, drug as far as the leaflet of the package is concerned that should also be complete so that uh, the, as far as the doctor and the patients who are advised they can get the maximum out of that the second part is the use of the medication and the prescription of the medication and the practices followed uh, by the hospitals and uh, the overall healthcare system. So I think uh, the basic aspect for medication safety uh, starts if the hospitals have the vision and mission from the topmost level uh, that they have, they should have a practice of uh, uh, medical reviews and uh, they should have a proper plan for medical reviews or what we call as the the, the uh, medication review plan, annual plan, that should be in place wherein uh, the medication review is appropriately done and the need for medication review can be intermittently determined that this area requires medication review. And when, before the hospital formulary is finalized, uh, again, the clinical quality team should make sure that they are taking into consideration every aspect as far as the different brands are concerned, as far as the products from different companies are concerned. And they select the best thing uh, after a due diligent uh, prolonged uh, discussion and prolonged investigation of the product that they are going to choose from, from different companies. And they, they should decide on the final list that should be going into the hospital formulary for that particular hospital. 
and during that thing i think most of the 80 or 90% of the work should have been done uh, before the final components of the hospital formula are decided for a hospital then the plan for the medication review should be in place as i said and also if there arises in between a need that for a particular scenario or for a particular class of patient or a particular ward of the hospital there is uh, there are chances that some errors are being produced or there are some observations which indicate towards some medication safety issues being created then in that case also medication review needs to be immediately taken so having a plan and then immediately deciding at the right time that what should be the uh, time to take a sudden medication review that should be very critical medication review uh, uh, technology based and e technology based medication review should also be in practice Uh, because we have softwares and other things now in place and uh, use of those softwares and technology to evaluate medication safety that should be taken up then uh, the whether the for the medication review whether whether we are utilizing the in house uh, experts as well as the outside experts and clinical pharmacy professionals uh, that is also very relevant uh, sometimes as we see in india still we have Uh, that particular lacuna that which contrasts with the western world or the international uh, community where in the clinical pharmacist who has the appropriate information on the the components the chemical nature the quality and the formulation characteristics uh, they also have valuable inputs to give as far as the possibility of any medication safety or related issues so whether we have a appropriate team and we have the experts uh, opinion taken from all the sides for medication review that also should be Uh, taken into account uh, then uh, the other aspects of medication uh, risk uh, should also be taken into account whenever whenever there is a possibility that uh, medical medication risk has to be re reduced uh, the the uh, uh, the the identification of the 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 interactions identification of the associated risk and identification of the possibility of adverse event that should be appropriately uh, documented and there should be standard operating procedures uh, pharmacovigilance is a very big area pharmacovigilance uh, uh, is uh, not only left to the pharmacovigilance industry it is also a very very significant practice for the hospitals and the related staffs who are regularly using the medication on the patients so uh, if we talk about the pharmacovigilance origination starts from the the practicing uh, the physicians who are working in the inpatient or the outpatient department so they should be very particular as far as the standard procedure for identifying an event and classifying it as an adverse event or a seriously adverse event has to be done uh, we have a very very systematic procedure when we take pharmacovigilance as an industry wherein the the, the event is first of all uh, identified then uh, the, it is uh, identified whether it is a signal or it is not a signal for an adverse event then it is uh, compared to the standard technology through the medra <coughs> medra and the other software which are available as far as the the pharmacovigilance international community is concerned and then they collect the data and uh, establish the significance of the event whether to classify significantly it uh, significantly as an adverse event or not so those things should be preliminarily at place whenever the the physicians are using the medicine and they should be uh, having a keen observation the other healthcare team should also be having a keen observation apart from the medication error the 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 administration of the drug administration of the dosage form that also needs appropriate uh, monitoring appropriate documentation uh, as to whatever the nursing staff or the other staff how they are uh, doing the medication and what is the the process they need to follow and what process they are actually following there may be very uh, small issues like issues uh, during uh, intravenous medication or central cannula or the other administrations and which may increase the risk of uh, medication errors or even the significant uh, occurring of some infectious occurrence which can take place because of the improper medication or improper cannulation or other activities wherein uh, intravenous drugs have to be used so uh, medication safety may be related to the administration process also as far, uh, uh, apart from the 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 possibility of uh, the the simple medication administration if it is not appropriate that also needs to be taken care of and the hospital based infections which may be during medication during intravenous medication or during surgical interventions wherein the surgical uh, points are, may, are not actually defined and during surgery medications are being used which are not appropriately uh, 
monitored for the dosing. For example, a simple example can be the use of anesthesia and use uh, respiratory stimulant during surgery. Uh, there, uh, there needs to be. There naturally is a protocol, and experts are already taking care of this. But uh, naturally, in some cases, there may be some issues which uh, which come into play when uh, medication safety is concerned. And during surgery and uh, during surgical procedures for particular areas and con con concomitant uh, medication use, there might be some sources uh, which can generate such sort of medical uh, medication safety uh, issues. So, uh, standard operating procedures need to be there in the hospital as far as uh, even if the hospital has the highest number of experts or highest number of people who are taking the care of uh, inpatient or outpatient or taking care of the surgical procedures, they still need to adhere to the standard operating procedures of uh, doing the things. They should not be uh, left to the individual choice as to if whether it's a senior expert or a junior expert. It should always be a standard operating procedure and uh, that needs to be always taken into account. That is why I think the need for clinical quality department in the accredited hospital is increasing. And uh, luckily, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, the clinical pharmacy position is emerging into senior research hospitals and very established research hospitals. And gradually, apart from this, we are beginning uh, to talk in the same way as the international community is talking about clinical pharmacists, who can definitely add, uh, because of their more than six years of education, they can add a lot of things into the, uh, the, the the clinical quality department by way of suggesting as far as the the pharmacokinetics dynamics and the physical chemical properties of the medications are concerned uh, the the second aspect i think uh, uh, dr shweta prabhakar was talking as uh, the awareness the awareness has to be definitely in the form of uh, within the hospital awareness uh, then outside the hospital then uh, the patients who have been uh, discharged from the hospital and they have been uh, they have been uh, allowed to continue their medication at home. So home care, home care medication safety is another issue that needs to be taken care because uh, there are many chances that when you allow patients to uh, continue their uh, further care after being discharged from the hospital, there may be chances that the 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 the, uh, the nursing staff who is taking care at the home or whether it is being self monitored by the family, there may be chances of errors which creep in just because of small changes in dose pattern or frequency pattern, or there may be some chances in the regularity of the medication usage. Uh, so all these things uh, are well known to the physicians who are working this and Dr. Kisa Prabhakar and other physicians. They are already well aware of these things. So naturally there needs to be a standard monitoring protocol, standard uh, uh, verification protocol as to how the medication at home care is being done and whether it is being uh, taken care of what will be the uh, frequency of being uh, followed up as to whether the uh, correct norms are actually being followed up. So sometimes uh, it is left to the patient and it is assumed that it will be happening rightly, but it does not happen rightly. So, uh, so, so that is the thing. Uh, the awareness naturally is uh, uh, there in the form of uh, the the in, uh, international national platform and national agencies like uh, the control authorities. We had a session from Dr. Chan Shekhar, then we also had a session from uh, um, uh, the from the expert from uh, Apollo Hospital, the clinical chief clinical uh, pro pharmacy professional. So they have already expressed that uh, the, 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 these uh, agencies or the hospitals are actually giving out uh, centers, uh, information from the centers wherein the, the medication safety can be propagated to the, the medication uh, healthcare team or to the patients or even to the nursing staff and even to the doctors because uh, you can't assume that uh, 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 anybody can be expert uh, to uh, beyond a certain limit so naturally everybody needs some some sort of re-education so possibly re-education is one area wherein your doctors should be continuously subjecting themselves to uh, and they should not be left to the confidence uh, with the confidence that uh, they have uh, done everything and uh, been there and done that naturally they need to be retraining themselves re and retraining themselves the healthcare staff also need to be retraining then we to have uh, the use of apps and the internet websites wherein the each and every hospital should take care that their patient should actually be well informed about the possibility of medication safety and uh, the standard operating procedures patients should be made to realize that there are standard operating procedures and they should not deviate that is the priority that the Every hospital should take care. And apart from the hospital formulary that they should be focusing upon, apart from the 
medication review and the frequency and the plan of the medication review and apart from the retraining and training of the healthcare and doctor uh, medication uh, the physician staff they should be focusing on establishing the relevance of the standard operating procedure to the patient that for everything there is a standard operating procedure so that is how i think a lot of things fall into place and we can make sure that there is a proper awareness and it can be cleared thank you thank you uh, thank you dr sandeep that's a you know quite a uh, insight into the various aspects of medication safety and uh, from here i would take the lead and would uh, like to open the panel discussion so uh, can we have all the panelists uh, what what i wanted to understand here is uh, when we i would just take on this aspect here uh, the pharmacovigilance right so um, dr sanjeev uh, being in you know a private healthcare sector and with uh, you know international certification how uh, is that standards helped helped you establish uh, the monitoring of adrs and uh, how you know uh, pharmacovigilance is there a uh, is there any uh, you know way forward which you would like to enlighten our participants with respect to uh, the medication safety in that aspect the pharmacovigilance and the adr monitoring uh, and uh, also i would like to add on here uh, you know the aspects of a clinicians the role of a clinician so earlier we spoke about the patient's role uh, in in you know capturing the adrs or you know pharmacovigilance what is the role of a clinician uh, would be we have to do the read back actually for so that we, there is no error with sound or lights okay. that is on lighter side yes okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay so when we started you know when you have a nice sop on drug administration and of course monitoring and so once you start monitoring the patient for effectiveness and of course adverse uh, drug event then next question is what to do with this event you need to report it so that appropriate action can be taken for that so we were the first private hospital to register with pharmacovigilance program of india now involving clinician in reporting many times clinician will say okay i know this is the side effect of this drug why should i report it it's already written in the literature then we have to convince them and tell them okay this data is it indian data the same side effect may be much commoner or much rare in our population in our setup so so that we can take appropriate step for mitigating that risk of that medication or if it is causing more adverse effect in our population and this effect will be known only when we start reporting them so once once we go back to them okay you have reported so many adverse effect and this has happened when we show them we could generate some signals out from our data and that signals have made changes in patient information leaflet they get convinced clinician get convinced second step is we have a bigger form of filling for adrs so these people uh, told us that we have very less time we don't have we told okay we'll make it very very brief of this we made a yellow uh, yellow card for reporting adr which has minimal information once that card comes to us my pharmacist goes and fill up the detail information of that adr so clinicians are really busy we need to partner with them and understand them they have lack of time in reporting when we start partnering with them giving them that facility you just give us a uh, uh, give us a uh, lead that this patient has adverse event we will further evaluate it and come back to you on that aspect so that is the way forward to work with clinician wonderful very nice uh, initiative which is i really appreciate that and uh, i'm sure uh, uh, that is really must must your adrs would have reporting must have increased and you would have been able to you know analyze more of the data which is absolutely beautiful. absolutely so uh, so moving on to dr sandeep uh, dr sandeep arora so so 
we wanted to understand about you know uh, when we were talking about initially about the medication safety and uh, you spoke about the uh, medication risk and medication review plan so uh, it's very interesting to understand about uh, when we talk about medication review plan how, what are the aspects which are most critical when we talk about medication review uh, before uh, in fact uh, you know finally their drug goes into the goes to the patient is being administered to the patient so what are the checks and balances or medication review what we are looking at what are the critical aspects uh, one should be looking at yeah uh, i think uh, i would like to highlight <coughs> one thing that is uh, uh, happening globally and uh, which is uh, which is i think a uh, 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 very uh, emerging area that is customized medication i think uh, uh, most of the panelists will be aware because of their expertise and because of their uh, uh, vast knowledge and their uh, professional area customized medication is uh, based on the fact that the medications are matched with the individual profiles of the patient their their physiology their pharma the kinetics pharmacokinetic pharmacokinetics and the adme parameters uh which uh, we sometimes be often see in areas like uh, cancer medication as well as in cardiac medications uh, and somehow which are happening wherein uh, many of the doctors are so expert that they are automatically doing it uh, uh, as 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 a live medication or maybe during surgery or other things uh, without actually uh, too much of fuss or without actually uh, knowing that they are actually doing that with, uh, uh, automatically sort of dodging the patients uh, uh, adme kinetics and other things and then titrating the dose up and down and even anesthetists we also see that anesthetists also sometimes do this thing during the operations they may make assessments which may be based on uh, some tests or which may be based on their assessment of the clinical conditions of the patients uh, based on the the uh, the respiratory depression or the the this uh, sort of uh, uh, the sedation that is being required or the 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 cholinergic or anticholinergic activity that is required so uh, but if we talk it in a very documented term customized medication uh, refers to a very uh, calculated matching of the dose and other medicines to the patient's uh, genetic and other uh, kinetic parameters of the body where it could be done so when we come to this uh, medication review uh, uh, i think uh, as i talked the hospital formulary and decision of the the brands that are to be selected uh, they are uh, first of all to be based upon the appropriate evaluation of the uh, physical chemical and uh, pharmaceutical properties and parameters of the drug naturally we need to have as as i said the pharmacy professionals and other so that they can be appropriately giving inputs as to which brands are performing better as i said they are performing better they should be performing better in the laboratory and accordingly they should be doing it. sometimes it happens that uh, there is a claim uh, from different companies but that claim may not be actually sufficing as when 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 the medication is actually working so from there itself the the medication review process starts wherein the hospital formulary is being set and automatically the filtering filtration of the best sort of medicine to be incorporated into hospital formulary has to be done wherein uh, the the first issue regarding the quality of the medication is taken care of the and the uniformity of, of the medication being supplied by different suppliers from batch to batch that also should be kept on be analyzed uh, so that is one thing second medication review is on on the part of the inpatient and medic and outpatient medication as i said uh, the review medication uh, review is uh, important in an aspect as i said even uh, with the the most uh, or the highest of an uh, expert in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, medicines or in uh, or in uh, surgery or any area there are chances that the exact assessment of the patient's condition exact matching of the medication or dose may not uh, be uh, be be actually happening so uh, uh, this can be done uh, we have some things like uh, medic uh, the the medical documentation review or the medical record review something like that they are already existing but sometimes the gravity of the uh, things or conclusion coming out of the medical records are not taken very seriously and actually they should be part of the medication review medical records all medical records when seriously looked into depth 
as to the finer nuances as to what are the things which are in uh, which can be read from in between the lines out of the things which are coming out and what the how the patient responded and how the patient recovered or the how the patient the short prognosis of the disease they they all automatically become part of the medication review uh, and as I, as i already said there should be a systematic plan of medication review uh, ward wise patient wise specialty wise and uh, the the our number based on the number of patients who are uh, who are visiting the ward uh, the higher the number of patients the more is the Uh, the more is the requirement for a frequent medication review. So accordingly, a medication review plan has to be there, which should be based on the load that individual ward is taking, the the number of uh, physicians or the other experts who are working for that ward, and the uh, the other area, uh, the the other uh, parameters that can be taken into account when deciding de deciding the frequency of the medication review. And as as I already already pointed out. Uh, there need to be an expert opinion from uh, within the hospital outside the hospital and also from a pharmaceutical science uh, professional so that all the factors are taken into account and uh, uh, and uh, uh, post discharge medication review uh, that that may be either in the form of medical record review or that will be either in the form of clinical quality review that should also be a continuous practice uh, the phasing of which has to be appropriately defined which may be Uh, it, uh, every ward and every uh, every facility may not have the same medication review plan, so they need to have their own individual plan that has to be decided by the head of the department for that. And uh, there should that should not be actually uh, as a stringent parameter that this is what is the standard uh, medication review plan for the whole hospital. It can it can be varied from one department to the other department. So there comes the role of the head of the department for that medical uh, that. Uh, summarize the uh, medication plan. That's interesting. Plan for it. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting. I think so. Uh, that is quite a comprehensive, and one has to, uh, you know, uh, with. depending upon the scope of the hospital and the patient uh, you know details and all so one can you know customize the medication which is uh, medication review plan also so uh, that's that's really uh, good where we can you know just we are actually uh, you know at the end of the uh, discussion i would just like to take a few questions so that the our participants uh, you know who have uh, you know have some queries regarding the but what is uh, it's important that when we talk about when the staff patient ratio is 1 is to 6 or 1 is to 7 how uh, high alert medication administration is possible with few nurses i thought because dr sachiv brought in the terminology uh, he would like to address but i think uh, I, that's a very pertinent point i mean you are bound to have a, um, breaches once you have that kind of uh, staff to patient ratio and uh, but all the same some things have to be repeatedly reinforced i mean so much so that it becomes by means of trainings reinforcements in various ways that it becomes some kind of a reflex that happens so oh, uh, you, and and not just staff to patient ratio you also have to deal with the turnaround time of the staff because a new batch of the staff may come and they may not be trained and up on that are those aspects which the previous batch would be so these are all have to be built in the system there and they have to, there has to be a process of passing on the information to the next set of people who take it upon themselves so that's that's something which is very pertinent it is bound to have breaches but the whole idea is to correct it and re repeat the cycles with improvisation every time yeah that's all that i would like to say on that uh, i i would like to say yeah. here uh, basically once you are convinced that this is important for safety of a patient any particular step whatever busy you are whatever you are doing you need to give priority to that step and the thing which is life saving for the patient definitely you will give priority for minor tasks so probably when we learn that not to compromise on those safety whatever busy you are please give priority to that that's the way i will say very uh, you know important aspects which both of you have addressed that it's important it has to be part of your you know daily routine and uh, moving on to some of uh, other questions which is like double lock key will implement for all high risk medicines or only for narcotic drugs 
uh, uh, can I take this question? Yes, yes, Dr. Like, Sanjeev. Okay. Yes. See, now you need to look into there are three important drugs which usually are in the ward narcotic, of course, because of addicting potential. Second is your concentrated electrolyte, which are killer medications. And if some nurse, junior nurse, if it is in single lock, opens that and uh, give that undiluted patient may die. So because of that, probably if you are storing outside pharmacy any concentrated electrolyte, keep that in double lock. Third important medication is, of course, we can't keep them under double lock, is your neuromuscular blocker, which are an, another killer medications and and I would like to highlight two years back in US, uh, this case happened where nurse who are posted uh, was posted in a radiology recovery uh, unit after contrast and all. And uh, a doctor told to give what said, which is metazolam. And there was a vacuronium vial, which was placed uh, near to that and she gave vacuronium. And there was no monitoring in that recovery room in that hospital. And patient died unattended there when vicoronium was given. So that may happen when you don't care, take care. And of, after that, there was a lot of hue and cry in the US and that nurse was uh, suspended, of course, her name removed from nursing council and criminal charges were put against her. This was the first thing I have heard, criminal charges against a nurse there in that case. So this drug is that important that's why I was telling whatever info, whatever BG you are, please take care of them because this our career also matters in such cases. Yeah, absolutely, very important. And uh, moving on to the next set, uh, what is PAT approval uh, which you used uh, in your slide, uh, one of the slides, Dr. Sanjeev? Uh, this is prescription audit. Basically, every prescription written by the doctor has to be reviewed by a clinical pharmacist. Whether this is uh, inpatient or outpatient, not possible in outpatient setting in our setup, but definitely for every inpatient, we can start doing it. Before a drug intent goes to the pharmacy, it has to be checked by a clinical pharmacist for seven step, steps of appropriateness. Whether this is this is the right drug for that patient, right dose, right route, and right frequency. Is there any drug-drug interaction, any drug food interaction for that particular patient? Is there any contraindication where it, it, it should not be used? Is patient allergic to this drug that need to be reviewed? Is there any physiological parameter which is abnormal, which this drug may affect? on that, like somebody having bradycardia and we are giving him uh, beta blockers. So probably we need to look into that, right? These are, and of course, therapeutic duplication. We like, we have a multi-speciality hospital and every doctor will have their own favorite brands. One comes and writes phosphostatin, some other uh, one comes and write atorvastatin. We know this is not required for the patient. And the person who can review it is a clinical pharmacist. So this is prescription audit. Only thing is always 24 into 7 should be done for every prescription and before their prescription audit, no drug in the hospital should be given except in case of emergency when there is a uh, code. Okay. We call it as PAR in our hospital. So it's a prescription appropriateness review. Yes. Uh, so we, we say that our, is a prescription is par or not? <laughs> so is it like we, we that terminology has been used? Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Moving on to uh, another set of questions, which, you know, there are uh, two, three questions which are very similar. When they talk about, you know, drug allergies being similar to ADRs, are they being, you know, synonymous or is there a difference? So the participants would like to understand the difference between the allergies or then ADRs. So, Dr. Nusrat? Yeah. So, in fact, drug allergies are a type of ADRs. It is just that they, well, as long as they're unpredictable, they become very difficult to, uh, I mean, there is no way one can foresee them. 
but uh, for some, uh, we have uh, considerable information that this group of agents, for example, certain kind of antimicrobials, or there are other groups of agents as well, which are known to be associated with drug allergy. So that information is there and uh, they have to be administered under observation. For some of them, we also have uh, uh, sensitivity testings, which have been described. Unfortunately, we do not have the um, required paraphernalia to undertake them as they uh, in, a, in a standardized manner. And a lot of uh, uh, wrong conclusions are also being drawn up by, as a consequence of the same. But uh, uh, they would be considered as ADRs. Uh, the only uh, thing is that uh, in order to minimize the consequences, whenever there is a priori information, with, uh, we, we should have appropriate measures in place. For example, if we know that there is a possibility of anaphylaxis or anaphylactide reaction, then all the required uh, preparation should be done in advance and it should be administered under observation. So so that's, that's something that I would like to say. Otherwise, uh, mm, there is no way they should be, I mean, the consequences make them important because all of it happens in a very a small period of time. Though there are certain drug allergies which can manifest over a protracted period of time. There are certain which can have, uh, which evolve gradually, but once they reach a certain a, a stage, for example, your scars, there uh, they are serious cutaneous adverse reactions, they can, have uh, uh, systemic manifestations which can be to which can totally go out of hand. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, so, uh, but yeah. one thing that I would like to say in this context is that uh, we have been talking about drugs all the time, uh, but many times, especially for allergies and especially for scars group of allergies, I think uh, adverse drug reactions. We have uh, uh, situations where it is a undisclosed use of alternative systems of medicines which are possible which really need to be brought under scanner and in our part of the region such use is quite common it is only the detailed medical history which really brings out this kind of information and uh, that's something that i would want all of our attendees to be aware of they're quite often overlooked but they're important causes even for drug allergies Thank you, uh, Dr. Nasrud. That's uh, a really good thought. And uh, you know, again, a very, very valid uh, point which you have raised. Uh, so the last question which uh, would be addressed to Dr. Sandeep uh, is, uh, you know, the participants, you, you mentioned about the medication uh, review tool. And is there any tool which you're referring to? Is there anything which is available uh, off the counter or is there anything uh, you know, available solutions, any solutions which are available, specific you would like to highlight, uh, or you can just type in on the chat box if you want to share some link or something. Um, yeah, Dr. Arora, Dr. Sandeep Arora. Yeah. yeah, there are databases available on all the aspects, on the on magnetic profiles of the drug, there are databases on the, on the, 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 uh, the the uh, pharmacological evidences for the drug. There are databases on the on the possible <laughs> toxicity and other reactions for the drug. So those databases are there, and uh, drug interaction databases are also there. So all those need to be uh, sort of taken into account. And uh, when uh, when the meetings are there happening, as far as the review is concerned, so these databases need to be taken into account. They need to be considered for actually uh, deciding as to the significance of the possibility of the medication safety or other issues. And uh, then there should be also be the background or the basics for deciding as to whether there is a medication safety issue or not. That has to be there. So databases maintenance uh, are also very important for hospitals. They should have all these uh, databases. Now we have very good databases. Uh, 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 lexicom, lexicom other databases are there, and even toxicology related databases are there. So there should be a good library for all these databases before we go for it. For it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Sandeep and all my panelists uh, for, uh, you know, gi giving us time and insight into medication safety uh, aspects. This is, uh, the, this is actually a very, very engrossing session. And there is so much to discuss. I, uh, what I decided on, there is, you know, like you, uh, you all will know that <laughs> we just covered 70-80%, uh, but uh, the time also is... Uh, uh, is now six. <laughs> so we are into the session and we could, you know, realize that we were uh, into the session for one and a half hour and uh, discussing some very important aspects of uh, medication without harm. Uh, I think so this gives us, uh, um, uh, for Kaho North Zone, this gives us a platform where we uh, take on to this, this level of discussion to a next level of discussion and we sometime meet again with the more, uh, you know, uh, interesting and uh, challenging, uh, you know, topics with respect to medication safety. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nusra, Dr. Sanjeev, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Sandeep, uh, for giving your valuable time and insights. Uh, I know that you are so busy, every one of you are so busy, but uh, uh, thank you uh, from uh, bottom of my heart uh, and uh, Kaho, uh, Thank you, and my North Zone, uh, you know, chairpersons. Uh, they are, uh, you know, the state chairpersons are also here. Thank you, uh, Satish, Dr. Priyanka, Dr. Anjani, Colonel uh, Pramod, for joining in uh, and uh, being supporting this uh, this initiative. And uh, 